In my last video, Who is Allah? Part 1, I dealt mostly with the texts that comprise the Hadith, the words and deeds also known as the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, and gave some examples of how they showed that Muhammad was a prophet of Satan. In Part 2, let's dive straight into the Quran itself, the book that is supposed to be the actual words of Allah, and see what it says about who he is. But here's a hint. Quran Surah 113, 1 and 2 say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil of what he has created. Hmm. Muhammad's God creates evil. Let's keep this in mind as we continue. As with any person or organization, you can tell out about them by who endorsed them and speak on their behalf. Are there any such kind of endorsements in the Quran that vouches for its authenticity other than Allah and Muhammad himself? Actually there is, as we find in Quran Surah 72, 1 through 2. Say, O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a company of the jinn has listened to the Quran and said to their people, Indeed, we have heard an amazing recital Quran which guides to the right way, so we have believed in it and will never associate a partner with our Lord. So who are these jinn? Well, in Surah 1527 and 5515 of the Quran, we find that jinn are made from fire. In Surah 712, it says that Satan himself was created from fire, and in 1850 that Satan is also a jinn. The jinn's true nature is talked about in Quran Surah 72, 6 as increasing men in sin and transgression, and in verse 8 and 9, while trying to steal news from heaven, they are prevented from doing so. So these are unsavory characters to say the least. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say these jinn are demons. One of the writers of the Sunnah also believed that jinn were demons, as we find in a hadith that's similar to the story found in Quran Surah 72, 8 through 9. That's in Bukhari, Volume 1, Book 12, Hadith number 740. At the same time, a barrier was put between the devils and the news of heaven. Fire commenced to be thrown at them. The devils went to their people who asked them, What is wrong with you? They said, A barrier has been placed between us and the news of heaven, and fire has been thrown at us. Continuing on with this hadith about the devils, we find another conversation that's like the one from Quran Surah 72, 1 through 2. They went to their people and said, O oh, our people, verily we have heard a wonderful recital, Quran, which shows the true path. We believed in it and would not ascribe partners to our Lord. This hadith concludes with, And what was revealed to him, Muhammad, was the conversation of the jinns. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard right. According to Bukhari, not only have the devils just endorsed the Quran and Allah, calling Allah their Lord, but we have also learned that jinn and devils are one and the same. Now knowing all this, let's find out what Muhammad said about jinn to his followers. That's recorded in Muslim, chapter 14, book 39, hadith number 6757. Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, said, there is none among you with whom is not an attaché from among the jinn, devil. They, the companion, said, Allah's messenger with you too? Thereupon he said, Yes, but Allah helps me against him, and so I am safe from his hand, and he only commands me for good. A demon commanding someone for good. Now there's an original idea. Or perhaps he's been so consumed by evil, he can't tell the difference between right and wrong. I think it's the latter. So the jinn or demon's endorsement of the Quran, Muhammad and Allah, can only mean one thing. It's an endorsement of the devil's religion. Since I'm making a serious claim here, let's review how we arrived at this point. When Muhammad was a child, some of his relatives were afraid he was demon-possessed. The people who lived with Muhammad, the Meccans, said he was demon-possessed. Muhammad himself said he was demon-possessed and later told his followers he had a demon attached to him. And finally, the demons endorse Muhammad, Allah, and his Quran. If this was a chess game, I would say checkmate. But since Muslims aren't allowed to play chess, Muslim, chapter 2, book 28, hadith number 5612. Anything to prevent a Muslim from thinking, I'll continue on. Well, some of you may be saying, that's a cheap shot. Why would Allah not want his followers to think? Well, think about it. If you find out you were worshiping the devil, what would you do? Allah knew this way back in the 7th century when he revealed Quran Surah 5 101. O you who believe, ask not about things which if made plain to you may cause you trouble. Because in the very next verse we find that those who did ask questions became disbelievers. Muhammad being the messenger of Allah also taught this 
as Bukhari records in his Sutta, Volume 8, Book 76, Hadith Number 480, that Muhammad forbade idle talk, asking too many questions in religion, and burying your little daughters alive. I guess Muslims have always had a thing for honor killings, but I digress. So now you know why anyone who even questioned Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, or names a teddy bear after him for that matter, must be immediately silenced. Because the truth, if it comes out, it's over. Their religion is finished. And to make the point perfectly clear that dissent will not be tolerated, and no one even thinks about leaving Islam, Muhammad taught his followers as recorded in Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Hadith Number 260. If a Muslim discards his religion, kill him. So now you know why you hear very few Muslims speak out against terrorism and violence. They can't. Not only is it un-Islamic, as I give examples of at the bottom of my blog site under the title, Terrorist Justification for Violence, they do so at great personal risk. As Muhammad told the Quraysh tribe in Mecca who criticized him, By him who holds Muhammad's life in his hand, I will bring you slaughter. Ishaq, The Life of Muhammad, page 131. If you're a Muslim and happen to get through hearing all this, contrary to what you might think, I don't hate you. If I was brought up in a Muslim society, I might think just as you do. Speaking of societies, we in the West have gotten to the point where we are afraid to make any value judgments about anyone or anything. But sooner or later, we're going to have to decide whether we value a culture whose deity says, for example, in Quran Surah 18102, we have prepared hell for the unbelievers as an entertainment for them. Or, value a culture whose God says in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Between a society that believes in Quran Surah 9 123, fight your disbelieving neighbors and let them find harshness in you. Or, one who believes in Matthew 22 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Contrary to what the atheists think, our laws in the West are found on the Bible. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, for example. Just as laws in the Muslim world are based on Islamic scripture, hence 200 lashes, for the rape victim. Also for Muslims, allow me to prove the Bible has not been corrupted as you've been taught, so that the Quran and biblical scriptures I have contrasted will make more sense to you. In Quran Surah 241, Allah through Muhammad said to the Jews in Medina, Believe in what I have sent down, this Quran, confirming that which is with you, the Torah and the Gospel, and be not the first to disbelieve therein. Now, there are two problems with that statement. First, the Jews don't believe in the Gospel. But more importantly, Allah said, The scriptures that are with you, that is, with the Jews, in Medina, in the 7th century A.D., the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek in the 3rd century BC. It's called the Septuagint, and it's used in biblical translations of the Old Testament today. There is nothing in the Old Testament about Allah or Arab prophet anywhere. So if the Old Testament today matches the Old Testament from the 3rd century BC, where does that leave Muhammad in the 7th century AD? In the New Testament, one of the most common verses used by Muslim clerics is John 14:16, which says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. If you read the very next verse, and also verse 26, it tells who the helper is, and it's not Muhammad. Let's read it again, John 14, 16-17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. John 14:26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You see, the Helper is the Holy Spirit. You can read any chapter or verse of the Bible for free online in almost any language, including Arabic, at www.biblegateway.com. I hope you will... And I hope these videos will be helpful to everyone who hears them.